Hello everyone. Please confirm if I am clearly audible to all of you. Let me know in the chat if I am clearly audible and the board is clearly visible to all of you. Okay, I assume uh, I'm audible to you. Fine. Good afternoon, everyone. Today in this session, we will be discussing about the previous year question paper for your DDA Assistant Architect 2019. Now, as you're aware, uh, DDA had released the Assistant Architect post again this year also, and uh, the form filling process is done basically. Uh, previously, also there have been uh, you know multiple times there have been examinations for the same. So the last time we had the architecture assistant examination for your DDA was in 2019. So in today's class, we are going to look at or today's session rather, we are going to solve your DDA assistant architect paper for 2019. We will be completing total, there are 120 questions. But uh, basically we will not be looking into the uh, general knowledge, the current affairs, the reasoning and the aptitude part. You can go through the previous year question papers, all the question papers, okay? Whether it be planning assistant question paper, whether it be architecture assistant question paper, you can go through that. Have an idea uh, of what all is going on, what kind of aptitude questions they ask. You can practice from there. We will in this particular session specifically focus about the core subject part from which 80 questions are asked, okay? So we are going to, uh, you know, tackle these 80 questions in your uh, three sessions. So today, tomorrow and day after tomorrow, we'll have three sessions in which we are going to tackle this question. Okay, fine. Let's start off. Okay. The first question, uh, let me just zoom this in so that it is visible to all of you. Okay, let's look into the first question. What is the first question saying? The center of gravity of a hemisphere, center of gravity of a hemisphere lies at a distance of dash from its base measured along the vertical radius. Okay, now first of all, what is a hemisphere? Hemisphere means you have a sphere, you cut the sphere in half, you get a hemisphere. Something like this. Okay, something like this and here you have let's say the center of the hemisphere. Now center of gravity is what? Center of gravity is that point in the body where we assume that the weight of the body is concentrated. Okay, so they are saying that the weight of this particular center of gravity, it lies at a distance dash from the base. That means this is the base, this is the base. So it lies at a distance from the base measured along the vertical radius. That means vertically when you measure upwards, it lies at a particular point. Let's say this point, center of gravity lies at this particular point. Okay. Now they are asking what is the distance? What is this particular distance from the base? What is the distance of this particular point? The answer is 3R by 8. Now for this particular calculation, um, you have to do basically integration. We don't need to go into that. Just remember it. And for a few, now see, these kind of questions can be asked, okay, you, you don't have that much time to do the integration and solve, okay, you have to remember these things. And what you have to do is, what a small homework for you is, please go through the center of gravity, the distance for a few basic structures like, let's say, cone, cylinder, all of those things, and try to remember those, okay, at least that much we can go for it. Otherwise, there's something that you have to basically keep in mind, okay. Next question. Dash footing is used in load bearing masonry construction. Dash footing, they are asking you which type of footing. There are four names of the footing which is given. They are asking you which of the footing is used in a load bearing masonry. The load bearing masonry, what kind of footing is used is basically strip footing. What is a strip footing? Let's try to see. Hmm. 
we have an image okay we don't have an image never mind strip footing is what let me explain strip footing for you strip footing footing you know already what a footing is just a second this is the foundation let's say whenever you have you have a superstructure and then you have the wall which is coming down and then you have let's say some kind of a footing some kind of a stepped isolated kind of a footing this is the column part and this is the footing part so the base of foundation you can say that is the footing part strip footing is what this is the kind of footing which you have along the entire length of the wall so you know load bearing masonry may the load is on the wall the load is transferred you have load bearing masonry in what happens what happens in load bearing masonry the load is completely transferred to the walls right that is why the footing runs completely across the length of the wall completely along the length of the wall whereas an isolated footing what happens isolated footing may you have one column and for every column you have a separate footing right there what is happening the load is being transferred to the column but in load bearing masonry there is no such thing as column the load is not getting transferred to the column it's getting transferred to the walls right so that is why strip mas uh, strip footing is the right answer again strap footing is what strap footing may you have two footings you have one footing like this and you have a strap b and then another footing which is there so basically what happens strap footing is generally used when you know let's say this is the boundary line of your building okay this uh, this is the boundary of your plot and this is your building let's say this is building and this is your boundary so when you don't have enough space between your building line and the boundary line and you need to you know have a footing there have a foundation there then what we do is we basically use the strap uh, kind of foundation in this what happens let's say the column is eccentrically placed here so what it does is through this strap beam the load gets transferred to this particular footing right when we don't have enough space between the building and the boundary line obviously you cannot make your foundation in somebody else's boundary line or somebody else's property so what you do is we have strap kind of footing where we what we do is the load is transferred to through this strap beam to this particular footing or through this particular column okay and pile kind foundation you already are aware of pile foundation is generally utilized for a it's a deep foundation wherever the safe bearing capacity the soil doesn't have the safe bearing capacity the top soil or the surface soil there what we do is we dig deep so that we can get a solid we can reach the solid bedrock and there we can basically transfer the load okay fine next question in a bridge truss what is the sequence of load transmission side trusses to stringers to beam floor beams to stringers to side trusses stringers to floor beams they are basically asking whenever in a in a bridge in a bridge truss means in a bridge whenever the load is getting transferred what is the sequence for that okay now before that there are three words you see side trusses stringers and beam floor beam let's try to see what a bridge truss is and let's try to understand what are these parts okay this is a bridge truss okay this is a bridge truss the trusses let's say even when you are you know uh, driving on the bridges you have certain bridges which is made up of truss system this is the truss system right this here that you have this part here this flooring part this is known as the deck of the bridge okay this flooring part is known as the deck of the bridge okay these green you can say uh, you know uh, kind of beams you or you can say the green support system these are known as your stringers okay these are basically what stringers are what here the load is first getting transferred so from the floor deck from the bridge deck the load is first getting transferred to the stringers fine then from the stringers the load is getting transferred to the floor beams okay something that is running perpendicular to your stringers right so then the load is getting transferred to the floor beams and then from the floor beams the load is getting transferred to the side trusses side trusses means on the side this truss system the lattice truss system that you see on the side then it is getting so first the load let's say even if if you drive a vehicle obviously the load is first getting transferred to the uh, your deck from the deck it is getting transferred to your stringers these members which are running parallel and then it is getting transferred to the floor beams which is running basically perpendicular to the stringers okay and then it is getting transferred to the side trusses so this is the transfer of load in a particular bridge okay you have to remember the name of the different different parts of the bridge so what will be the answer for this 
the answer will be from your stringers to floor beams to side trusses. Okay. Then your floor beams to stringers to side trusses. Side trusses. Yeah, obviously. See, from side trusses, the load can never be, if we, even if we try to eliminate this, from the side trusses, definitely the load is not going to start. The sequence of load transfer will not start from side trusses, right? The load will first be applied to the bridge, the bottom, the surface. Side trusses on the side. Obviously, that is not the starting point. So, we can clearly say these two are definitely not the answers, okay? So, obviously, first it starts from the stringers to the floor beams and to the side trusses. I hope this is clear. Okay, fine. No questions as for next let's see okay which of the following timber is not good for construction of houses they have given four options they are asking which is not good for construction of houses okay uh, one thing that we know is again these are things that you have to be aware of okay we know that sisu is definitely sisu means what this shisham tree in hindi may we call it shish, shisham sisu is basically you can say an english name or it is a name which is derived from its biological name, okay, botanical name. Uh, that is Dalbergia Sisu. So, uh, Shisham is a very good, Shisham uh, furnitures are pretty costly also, if you are aware of it. So, Shisham is definitely good for construction. Apart from that, Babul is also good for construction. Blackwood is not good for construction, okay. Blackwood is not a tree or not a timber that is good for construction. So, the answer for this particular question will be your Blackwood. Answer for this particular question will be black. Okay. Five. Question number five. In which region Aryans first settled? So they are asking that Aryans they settled in which region first. So when Aryans came in, again, this is a little bit history. So when you study about history, when you study about the civilization, you will read about it a little bit. So basically, when your Aryans came in, they basically first settled in your uh, Punjab region. Okay. So the answer will be Punjab. Definitely not Uttar Pradesh. Uh, don't get confused with Rajasthan. Maybe you might get con uh, confused with Sindh province, but it's actually the Punjab region. Okay. Just give me a minute, please. Okay. Fine. Next question. Which type of joint commonly used at the junction of a principal rafter and a tie beam in a timber truss? Okay, they are asking that which kind of a joint is used between the principal rafter and the tie beam in a timber truss. So, let's say timber truss is there, a truss which is made up of timber and then you have the principal rafter and you have the tie beam. So, you have the tie beam here. And you have the principal rafter here. So there is a kind of an oblique joint. Okay, there is some kind of an oblique joint. Okay, let's see the options. Butt joint. Butt joint will definitely not be there. Butt joint is what? It's like a 90 degree kind of a joint. You are joining one. This kind of a, uh, you know, this kind of a piece is joined with a, this, kind, this kind of a piece. Butt joint. They are just joined with each other and then you can put a nail into it. That is the butt, kind, butt joint. Okay, that, this kind of a joint is butt joint. Okay. Then you have mortise and tenon joint, oblique mortise and tenon joint. Let's look into what are these different types of joint. Okay. This is what? This is the principal rafter. This is the principal rafter. Look at the image properly. This is the principal rafter. Take it. And then what is this? This is the tie beam. I just now drew this image also. Now please focus here. Sorry. Please focus on this particular point. I'll just zoom in for you also. This point, do you see there is an oblique kind of a thing which is being formed when you are trying to join? It's not a 90 degree. So definitely butt joint won't be there. Okay. So what kind of a joint will be there? Let's try to see other options. Let's try to see other joints which are there. You have something called as your mortise tenon. Mortise tenon is something like this. You have a tenon here and you have a mortise here. That means you have an extension here. And there you have a kind of a niche. So this extension goes inside the niche and a joint is formed. This is your mortise tenon. You have to be aware of the names of different type of joint and what they stand for. Okay. You have to be aware of this. So keep this image in mind or you can even draw this down. What is mortise tenon? This is something like that. Definitely this is not what is happening. But something maybe similar to this is happening. Okay. Oblique mortise tenon. Right. Oblique mortise tenon is when you want to join. Let's say you have one horizontal member, 
or one vertical member and you want to join an inclined member with it. So the other member is not completely the other member that you have. Okay, just a second. Let's say you have one member which is something like this. Okay. And the other member is inclined. It is not completely right angle. It's not right angle. It's not 90 degree like this. It's not like this. It is inclined. So when you want to join an inclined member with a horizontal or a vertical member, you use oblique mortise and tenon joint. Oblique mortise and tenon joint means here the mort uh, this tenon. Here the tenon is like what? Straight, square shape. But here the tenon is oblique in shape. Okay. So keep this shape in mind. Butt joint, I told you what a butt joint is. Basically, you have one, uh, you know, you have one uh, part like this and the other part is like this. And then you basically, what you do, you nail some kind of a thing inside to you know bring them together. That is your butt joint. And one more joint you have, which is your mitered joint. Mitered joint is what? One more joint was it? Mitered joint. Let me just have a look. Yes, butt joint definitely butt joint is not there. So oblique and mo oblique mortise and tenon joint will be there. Mortise and tenon joint won't be there. Okay. And mitter joint is what? Basically, you have one like this. And in the other part, you have these kind of extensions which are coming out. So that is kind of mitter joint. Okay. So definitely that is also not the answer. So the for this particular question, your answer will be number two, oblique mortise and tenon joint. Okay. Let's look at the next question. Question number seven. Which among the following was sign of union of upper and lower Egypt? The column, so they are asking among these following things, which is the sign of union of upper and lower Egypt? Upper Egypt and lower Egypt is what? Basically, the liver Nile flows something like this, okay? In this direction, right? This part is the lower Egypt part. And this part is the upper Egypt part. Okay, why? Because it is flowing to the uh, to this particular direction. It's flowing in this particular direction. That is why it is known as lower Egypt. And this is part is known as upper Egypt. Okay. Initially, upper Egypt and lower Egypt, Egypt was two different places. But later on, they got unified. Okay. So, basically, they are asking you which is the sign of your union of upper and lower Egypt. The First, the column with historical and religious events on the capital. No. The column with shaft like papyrus plant systems combined with the lotus bud or flower. Yes, this is the answer. The column with the flower capital on the shaft. No, the flower uh, column with the shaft like papyrus plant systems with the sphinx on the capital. No, sphinx is there always. Okay. So basically, papyrus is a, you can say it's a symbol of your lower, uh, lower Egypt. Papyrus is a common symbol used in lower Egypt. And lotus is a common symbol which is used in upper Egypt. So later on after the unification happened, what they started to do was they started to build columns which had, you know, both the uh, symbol of lotus and the papyrus. So that kind of showed that there is some kind of a unification that is happening. So the answer will be number two. Then we have question number eight. Dash is the suggestion of action or direction. The path our eyes follow when we look at the work of art. Okay. So basically, something is a suggestion of action or direction. That means the path our eyes follow when we look at the work of art. Proportion is definitely not the path. Proportion is what? You know, having some kind of a relation of scale. That means if you are drawing a human body, your head should be in proportion with the hand. You cannot have a huge head and then a small, you know, human body. So that proportion should be there. So there is a relativity of scale factor. Simplicity or visual economy is basically the concept of simplicity. And visual economy is basically how visually appealing that particular thing is. These are your, you can say these are uh, your basic elements of design, okay. Then rhythm. Rhythm means what? It's a repetitive pattern. Say, let's say you are making a drawing and in a, or you, you are doing some kind of composition and in a composition, you repeat a particular element to create a move, to create a kind of a rhythm, to create a kind of a rhythm. You can say a kind of a pattern. That is what rhythm is. Basically, repetition of certain elements to create a pattern kind of a stuff. And then movement. Movement is what? You are creating a movement in the image. That means you are leading the eye through a certain path. Let's say you want somebody to start looking at the image from this side and then focus on this part. So that is the path our eyes follow when we look at the work. So the answer will be four movement. Okay. 
Number nine. Which of the following projection method is assumed to be transparent? Four angle projection method, first angle projection method, third angle projection, planets of projection. Okay. Let's look into the projection method first. What are the different types of projection method? If you don't know what is a projection method, you will not be able to answer. This is what a projection method is. Basically, see, there are quadrants. This is first quadrant. Then you have third quadrant. First, second, third, fourth. Okay. Something like this. So, this is the first quadrant, second quadrant, third quadrant and the fourth quadrant. Okay. Now, first, whenever you do any kind of projection of object in the first quadrant, it is known as the first angle system. And in the first angle system, what we assume that these planes, there are three planes, right? It's a 3D image, so there will be three planes. So, these planes are your opaque. Only when it is opaque, you'll be able to see this image properly. You'll be able to project this image. Whenever you project an object, you project it on the planes only, right? And then, like, you can project the image of this object on the planes. So, you assume that the planes are opaque. So, in the first angle system, you always assume planes are opaque. And third angle system is what? Whenever you project any kind of object in the third angle, we assume that is what is called as the third angle system. So, in order to see this third angle, you have to assume that all the other planes are transparent because it is lying in this particular area. So, if you want to view it, if you are standing here, if you want to view this, you have to assume that this plane is transparent. If you are watching it from here, you have to assume this plane is transparent. So, in this case, what we assume is that the planes are transparent. Okay. So, in question what they are saying, In question what they are saying, they are basically asking that in which of the following projection method is the, uh, you know, is uh, transparency assumed. So, just now we saw that transparency of planes is assumed in your third angle projection system. Okay. So, definitely not the first angle. First angle, the planes are considered to be opaque. Fine. Four angle projection method is nothing and planets of projection. It's just given to confuse you. Okay. First angle and third angle. Keep that in mind. Next. Member used to carry wall loads over openings are called girder, lintel, rafter and purlin. So, you are already aware of it. The answer would be lintel. What is the question saying? Member that is used to carry the wall load above openings are called. So, in a wall, whenever you have any kind of opening, let's say you have a window opening. So, above the window opening, you have a lintel beam. This is what this is lintel beam. So, lintel beam does what? Whatever load, obviously there, are, there is wall above it also. So, whatever load that is being projected, that is taken up by the lintel beam. So, whenever you have openings, you have to give a lintel beam in order to basically support the load or carry the load which is coming from above it. Okay. So, answer is lintel. Question 11. Which of the following is... The incorrect statement. Water demand at various points in the city should be noted. Uh, this is definitely a correct statement. In different areas of the city, water demand can be different. Okay. If a location is maybe industrial, the water demand will be high. So, you have to keep in note which area has how much water demand. You have to keep in note. So, this is definitely the right option. Then, the next option says is, the main pipeline designed for distribution of water should carry three times the average demand of the city okay the main pipeline third option the main pipeline design for distribution of water should carry two times the average demand of the city the service pipe should be able to carry thrice the average demand okay this is something basically what is this this is something a standard based question you have to basically keep this in mind so the one which is incorrect is the service pipe should be able to carry thrice the average demand. There is no such standard like this. The service pipe should be able to carry three times. There is no such standard. Yes, the main pipeline should be designed in such a way that it should be able to carry three times the average demand. That means you always demand, you always design for more. Okay, whatever the demand is, you always design for more than that because in future, if the demand increases, your pipes, whatever pipes are there, they should be able to fulfill the demand. You cannot keep on rebuilding the water system, the water distribution lines, pipe, pipelines every now and then. This is an expensive affair. So, obviously, you demand, you design for more amount. But the service pipeline should be able to carry thrice the average demand. There is nothing like that. This is a service pipeline. Okay. So, the answer, that means the incorrect statement is this. Okay. So, keep in mind. If you have any doubts, you can ask in the chat box also. Okay, next question. Dash is a horizontal structural member subjected to transverse load perpendicular to its axis. 
बीम कॉलम प्लस स्ट्रक्चर हॉरिजॉन्टल स्ट्रक्चरल मेंबर्स ये हॉरिजॉन्टल डेफिनेटली इट विल नॉट बी कॉलम uh it is not even strut and it is truss not even truss truss means what it's a combination of different members in different parts okay and it is not even strut the answer is b now what is transverse flow transverse flow is what this is a beam this is the longitudinal axis of beam transverse load is this load this particular load so whenever you have load which is perpendicular to the longitudinal axis that is known as the transverse load and whenever you have a load which is basically parallel to the longitudinal axis that is known as axial load so you can write here transverse and this is what this is your axial load so this is this is a beam this is the longitudinal axis of beam so whenever there is a load which is being exerted perpendicular to the longitudinal this is the longitudinal axis this load is perpendicular to it that means at 90 degree that is known as transverse load and whenever you have a load which is being subjected along or you can say parallel to the longitudinal axis that kind of load is known as axial load please keep these things in mind that what is an axial load and what is a perpendicular load okay okay next question uh, i hope this till here we are clear next question which of the following pairs is which of the following pairs is correctly matched that means they have given some pairs and they are asking us which is correctly matched first basalt metamorphic a uh, basalt you must have studied is not a metamorphic rock it's a igneous rock limestone yes limestone is a sedimentary rock this definitely looks right granite is argillaceous no granite is not argillaceous granite is siliceous rock and sandstone is igneous sandstone is definitely not igneous rock okay sandstone we know that in sandstone there are layers so you know that wherever there are layers in a rock wherever rock is made of multiple layers those kind of rock is known as sedimentary rock so sandstone is a sedimentary rock so what you can do is you can write the correct option like basalt is igneous granite is siliceous sandstone is sedimentary so the only right option is your number 2 that is your limestone which is which is a sedimentary rock okay limestone is a sedimentary rock okay next question under which method of dimensioning all dimensions are shown all dimensions are shown along along a common base line so there are different types of dimensioning they are asking in which of the following in which of these following method all the dimensions are shown along the same line let's try to see what are the different types of dimensioning and then you will understand Okay, let's look at the dimensioning system. There are different types of dimensioning. Uh, you are architecture students. You must have done. Uh, you must have made sheets. You must have done dimensioning. So, so you must be aware of it. First is chain dimensioning. Chain dimensioning is what basically all the dimensioning is done one after another. You see here. Sorry. You see here, you have one dimension here. Then basically, it's like in a chain. It's not the. It's not like one sixty is here, then one seventy is here, then two hundred is there. No, it's all in the same line, like a chain. So that is why it is known as chain dimension. Second is your parallel dimensioning. Parallel dimensioning means what is happening? All the dimensions are one. You know, there is one dimension, and then parallel to it, you have another dimension, and again parallel to it, you have another dimension. So they are one below each other. Okay. Now here, you see. There is a common baseline which is taken. If you look at this particular point, you will notice that there is a common baseline. That means all the dimensions are taken. This dimension is taken from here to here. This dimension is taken from here to here. This dimension is taken from here to here. So there is a common baseline from where the dimension or the distance is taken. That is your parallel dimension. ठीक है? Chain dimension. I just now told you all the dimensions are in one single line. Parallel dimension में you have one single one common baseline. and from that common baseline all the other dimensioning is taken dimension is being taken then you have combined dimension combined dimension means what it's a combination of chain plus parallel that means there are dimension which are in one line and then it is in parallel to each other also okay 
Then we have progressive dimensioning, dimensioning by coordinates. So I'm adding all of these things. You can take a look. We are not going to go in that much deep. Let's go back to our question because we have looked into. Okay, just to give me a minute. So the question was basically asking that under which of method of dimensioning all dimensions are shown with a common or from a common baseline. So just now we started about in which dimension do we have a common baseline? In parallel dimension, there is nothing about smaller dimensioning. Continuous or chain dimensioning, basically the same thing we just saw. It is all in the same line. But from a common baseline means let's say this is some kind of a thing, then you, are, you have a common baseline and from that baseline you are taking all the dimensions. So this is the common baseline. Okay, so answer is your parallel dimension. Next question 15, the sensitiveness of a bubble tube in a level would decrease if, so you must have seen there are, uh, you know, leveling devices in that what you have this kind of a thing and then you have a bubble. So basically when you place that on a horizontal table, the bubble moves from here in these two directions from here to there. So whenever the bubble is in the center of that tube, the spirit tube, you can say that, okay, my table is completely placed in a proper horizontal manner. It's, it's properly leveled. So whenever you want to check the leveling, whether you're, you know, in, while doing a survey, whenever you want to check the leveling, you use a bubble tube, okay, to see whether you have a horizontal, you have a proper horizontal surface or not. So they are saying the sensitiveness of that bubble in a bubble tube, that means how sensitive, that means even with a little bit of movement, if there is a change in the position of the bubble, that means what? The bubble tube is very sensitive. But even if it is moving a lot, still the bubble is placed in the center only. That means what? It is not that sensitive. So that sensitiveness will depend on which of the following factor. First, radius of curvature of the internal surface of the tube is increased. So if the radius of curvature of the tube increases, will the sensitiveness increase or decrease? Like will it impact the sensitiveness? Obviously not. The radius is increasing. The amount of water that you keep inside, the amount of spirit that you fill up inside, not water, the spirit that you fill up inside, that is going to change. Nothing else is going to happen, okay? It's not going to increase the sensitiveness or decrease the sensitiveness. Length of the vapor bubble is increased. If the length of the vapor bubble is increased, again, the sensitiveness does not increase. Fine? The length is increased. Viscosity of the liquid is increased. Viscosity is what? Viscosity is basically a nature of a liquid. So, a liquids or let's say any kind of liquid, any kind of fluid, a fluid's resistance to flow, whenever a liquid shows some kind of resistance to flow, that means what? It has viscosity. So if a liquid is extremely viscous, what will happen? If you throw, you know, if you drop it like that, it will not flow properly. Like if you have a glass of water and you turn the glass like this, the water will immediately flow down, right? Why? Because water has very less viscosity, extremely low. Whereas if you take, let's say, some kind of, uh, you know, let's say you mix some kind of jelly powder and water what will happen the viscosity will increase and then if you turn like that what will happen the water will flow or the you know solution will flow out very slowly so that is called as viscosity more the viscosity less will be the movement so yes if the viscosity of the liquid is increased obviously the bubble will not move very easily if the viscosity is reduced then the bubble will move very easily but if the viscosity is increased the bubble will not move easily so yes the viscosity of the liquid if the liquid is increased then that will affect the sensitiveness of the bubble. And diameter of the tube, again, doesn't impact. Okay. Next question. Moment of inertia of a hollow circular section with diameter of main, with the diameter of main circle and small d diameter of outer circle. So they are saying that there is a hollow circular section, something like this, and diameter of this is your small d. And diameter of this is your capital D. So they are asking what will be the moment of inertia. Again, keep this in mind. The moment of inertia for this is your pi by 64 d to the power 4 minus d to the power 4. This will be the answer. Again, you don't have time to find out the moment of inertia in examination. You have to solve one question in one minute. Keep this in mind. Okay. 
Next question is number 17. What does the in what does it indicate if the yield curve is above the consumption curve in a hydrograph? Okay, firstly, what is a hydrograph? Hydrograph is a process by which you can find out the capacity of the reservoir. Reservoir is what? You have something called as reservoir. Reservoir, what is a reservoir? Basically, it's kind of a place where you store water. Okay, we are talking about water storage. So, whenever you have to find out how much big or how much, what should be the size of the reservoir, for that we sometimes use hydrograph. Generally, hydrograph is not used for that, but we can also use hydrograph for the reservoir purpose to find out the size of the reservoir. Now, what is a hydrograph? In a hydrograph, you have a hydrograph something like this, and in that you have, let's say, this is the yield curve and let's say this is the consumption curve including the losses okay yield curve means how much you're getting how much water supply you're getting and consumption curve means how much it is being utilized or how much demand is being happening and this consumption is always including losses including losses right because See, whenever the water is getting transported, it's not like no loss is happening. There might be some leakage, some, somewhere the pipe is broken, something is happening. So, something loss is happening. So, including the losses, you have the consumption curve. So, let's say this is the yield curve. This red one is the yield curve and this blue one is the consumption curve. So, in the question, they are saying that if the yield curve is above the consumption curve, that means the water inflow, the water that we are getting is more than the water that we are using up. What does that mean? Surplus water which cannot be stored, yes, we are getting, if we are getting more water than we are using, that means there is some kind of surplus water. But we cannot store means what? We can obviously store the surplus water, okay? So, this will not be the answer. Outflow of water is less than the demand. Uh, no, I mean, inflow is more than the demand. There is nothing called outflow. Outflow is basically the water that is going out after utilizing. So, outflow of water is less than demand. No, it's not like that. Inflow of water is less than demand. Inflow is less than demand. Your yield curve is above the consumption. That means you are getting more water than you are utilizing. So, obviously, inflow is more than demand. It's not less than demand. So, this will also be the, not the right answer. Inflow water is more than demand. Yes. Inflow water is more than demand. Answer will be number 4. Okay. Again, if you have doubts, you can definitely ask. I hope this is clear to you. Number 18, which of the following methods is suitable for hilly areas and at places where plane tabling is impractical? Plane tabling is a survey method. So, in hilly areas, plane tabling, may what happens? You have to set up a plane table. There is a table kind of thing. There are different equipments attached to it. That's a plane table used for survey. So, in hilly areas, it is generally not very useful. Like, plane table is kind of a graphical method, okay? It's also a kind of a graphical method. So, plane table is not suitable. So, what kind of survey method do we use? We use stachyometry survey method. We don't use method of squares. We don't use method of cross section. We use the stachymetric method. Okay. Next, question 19. The space between adjacent bent in a roof truss is called what? Firstly, you have to understand what is a bent in a roof truss and then we can see the answer. Let's look at an image. Okay. This is a roof truss. You just now we saw. These are known as your bend. This one you see. These elements, these elements, these vertical members, these are known as bend. And the distance between two bend is known as a bend. Okay, these vertical members are known as bent and the distance between the two vertical members is known as B. So, the answer will be what for this one? The answer will be the space between adjacent bent and the roof truss is known as B. Okay, it's not known as purlins, it's not known, purlins is a part of it. Okay, you have purlin, you have purlin cleat, that is a part, that is not the distance definitely. It's not even braces, it's not even knee. So, the answer is B. Number 20. Under which era of architecture were the palm leaves and reed mixed together to strengthen clay which was used to make clay bricks? bricks. So, they are asking under which, type, which era of architecture did they mix palm leaves and reeds together? So, palm leaf and reeds, wherever you hear these two names, you just know it is your Egyptian. 
Romans were not mixing palm leaf and reed, definitely. They were the ones who started using concrete, so definitely they're not doing all of those things. Even Greek people, you know, they're not mixing palm leaves and reed. Uh, early architecture, again, that's a very broad term. There, are, there is a lot under early architecture, okay? So we cannot say that. So Egyptian, even if you don't know the answer, you can take a wild guess. But if you have studied about history, you will know that Egyptian means what palm and the papyrus, palm, reeds, these are all the materials which were used in your Egyptian civilization. Question number 21. Which factor governs the limit that can be assigned for the area up to which a survey can be treated as clay? So they are asking you which is the, basically, you know, whenever you are surveying an area, you basically designate an area. Okay, see the earth surface is curved, okay, but then you designate the area that this much area is treated as a plane surface. So for that, what factor is important? Your degree of accuracy is important, okay, not the character of work, not the magnitude, not the plane of survey. Degree of accuracy is something that governs the area which has to be demarcated for the survey purpose. Question 22. What is the area below the subsoil which consists weathered parent material okay so they are asking basically that what is the area below the subsoil which consists of the parent material so you have whenever you're making the soil diagram you have multiple layers and then you have the parent rock material so they are asking what is this parent rock material in terms of horizon this is basically your sea horizon okay you know there is o horizon uh, on the top you have the top side which is also known as the o horizon then you have a b and then you have the sea horizon okay so answer will be your number four that is the sea horizon so the part which consists of the weather parent material not the parent material the weather this part parent material is r horizon okay that is the rocky area Weathered means your parent material is getting weathered. Just above the parent material, you have the weathered parent material. That is your sea horizon. Right? You can keep these things in mind. These are, again, horizons are also asked. They will not ask you in terms of topsoil, subsoil and all of these things. They might ask you in terms of your horizon. Number 23. If the member connected do not lie in the same plane, then the structures is called as foot truss, plane truss, main truss, space truss. If all the members which are connected, if they do not lie in the same plane, they are known as space trust. Why? Let's see. This is something your space trust looks like, right? Your space trust looks something like this. This lies, let's say there is a vertical plane. This, both of these lies in the vertical plane. But this one, it's a bit tilted. I don't know if you are able to see. See? Okay, here you will be able to see. See, this joint, it's lying on, let's say this joint, it's lying on this particular uh, plane. Whereas this joint, it's lying on this plane. So, both of these joints are not lying on the same plane, right? So, when you have different, different joint and they don't lie on the same plane, that is known as your space truss. Whereas plane truss, plane truss means what? Plane truss means something like this. This joint, this joint, this joint, this joint, all of them are on the same horizon, or same vertical plane. Something like this. Look at, even you can take a reference of this particular uh, image. In the first one where we saw the truss system. Yeah, basically this one also. This joint, this joint. These are known as plain trusses, okay? The option was also there. See, these joint, this joint. These are all on the same plane. So if they are on the same plane, that is known as plain truss. But if they are not on the same plane, then that kind of truss system is known as your space truss. So you must have seen even in certain uh, buildings, you have space trusses, something like this. And then you have truss system. You have truss system which is going on in the center. So here what is happening? All of these joints are basically lying in different, different planes. That is what is known as space truss. Okay. Okay. One peculiar variation found in Jain temple is Dvimuk, Chomuk, Trimuk, Panchmuk. See, Jain temple, we have one variation that is Chomuk. Chomuk means Chomuk or they also call it Chaturmuk. So whatever is the option, you can write one of those. Chomok means what? You have the idol. The idol ha is basically has four faces. So the idol faces four cardinal directions, north, south, east, west. Okay. So that kind of is, uh, you can say another kind of an, uh, you know, uh, image or you can say a different representation of Lord Tirthankar. You know, Tirthankar is the Lord of Gens. So uh, there is an idol of Lord Tirthankar which has 
uh, whose uh, ID is basically uh, faced in four different directions. So you have one face which is facing the front direction and then you have a head, you know, like head in each four directions. So uh, front, side and at the back. So this kind of an idol is there in your gender. Also the Garbhagriya. Garbhagriya means the main uh, shrine uh, room. The main room in which, which your shrine is located that is known as Garbhagriya. So the Garbhagriya also has four uh, entries from your four directions. Generally in other temples if you go you will have maybe one direction may entry or maybe in three directions. You won't have entry from all the four directions. I'm talking about specifically Garbhagriya. Okay. Whenever you enter into Garbhagriya, generally Garbhagriya may entry is only in one direction or maybe two, three. But in these kind of temple, the Garbhagriya may entry you can go through the four directions. That is why the idol is also facing in four different directions. Okay. So this is something that you can keep in mind. Jain temple is Chomuk. Another word for brightness of a color is complementary hue value intensity. Brightness of a color is basically also known as the intensity. That means how bright or how dull a color is. Intensity. Not complementary. Complementary colors are what? On a color wheel, there are colors which are opposite to each other. Those colors are known as complementary. That means if you mix these two colors, they will basically cancel out each other and they'll form a grayscale kind of a tone. Hue is basically your origin, you know, original group. Let's say uh, yellow. You have multiple shades and multiple, uh, you know, let, let's say lemon yellow is there, sunset yellow is there. But the origin, the parent group is yellow. Similarly, red maybe you have crimson, but the parent group is red. So the original group, the parent color that is known as hue. And then value is basically how lighter or how darker our color is. Bright and light may there is difference, okay? Don't get confused. Value is how lighter or how brighter the color is. That means take a color, if you keep on mixing white to it, it will keep on getting whiter. If you keep on mixing black to the color, it will keep on getting darker. That is what your value is. That means how close to white or how close to black a particular color is. That gives the value of the color. Intensity is how bright or how dull. Like this is a brighter red and this is a duller red. Okay, something like this. So brightness is basically linked with intensity. Next, at the top of the troposphere, temperature abruptly begins to, begin to rise. This boundary where temperature reversal occur is known as thermopause, tropopause, stratopause, mesosphere. Uh, you should be aware that the atmosphere of Earth has five layers. What are the five layers? You have troposphere. You have stratosphere. You have mesosphere, thermosphere, and exosphere. Okay. Tropo, strato, meso, thermo, exo. You, sometimes you must have also heard about ionosphere and everything. That is a part of your thermosphere only. Okay. Now what happens is that there is a phenomena called temperature inversion. That means generally we know as we keep on moving, you know, as the altitude keeps on increasing, the temperature decreases. That means if I draw a graph, something like this, which says uh, altitude and temperature, then we know, let's say this is the, these are the different boundaries, okay. Then we know that as we keep on moving higher, the temperature keeps on decreasing. So as we keep on moving higher, the temperature keeps on decreasing. But at a particular point, the temperature completely inverts. That means after that particular point, the temperature keeps on increasing. It is through this point that we come to know that the, there is some kind of a change in layer. That means till this point, there is a troposphere. But after this, there is a diff, little bit change in the layer. That is why we say this is a stratosphere. How do we know that there is a boundary between stratosphere and troposphere? How do, how do we know? We cannot see in the, in the sky there is no definite boundary. There is no boundary which is drawn, right? So how do we know that there is a boundary here? We know it through this particular point, the point where the temperature inversion takes place. And the point where temperature inversion takes place is known as tropopause. Similarly, the boundary that is tropopause is basically the boundary between your strat troposphere and stratosphere. It is on this boundary that the temperature inversion takes place. The boundary between stratosphere and mesosphere is known as stratopause. 
Similarly, between mesosphere and thermosphere, it's known as mesopause, thermopause, exopause. Okay. You can go on like this. Fine. So the answer will be tropopause. Okay. Okay. Next question, question number 27. Which constituent imparts yellow tint to the brick? Magnesia. Iron oxide, you know, see, even if you don't know uh, what iron oxide does, what you can remember, you know that rust is basically iron oxide, so that has a yellowish tint. Whereas magnesia, it gives a yellow, uh, sorry, iron oxide has a reddish tint, sorry. Magnesia gives the yellowish. So in the break, you must have seen a little bit of yellowish tint also, that is basically imparted by magnesia. Iron oxide gives the, the reddish crimson color that you have, the beautiful crimson reddish color that is given by the iron oxide, okay? So, which uh, constitute imparts yellow tint to the brick? It's magnesium. Next question 28. As for quality of good brick, no brick should have a crushing strength. Okay. So they are asking you, as for quality of a good brick, which is, what is the crushing strength of a brick? Okay. No brick should have a crushing strength of above 5.5 Newton per meter square. Like, see, 5.5 Newton per meter square or 5 point. Uh, Newton per meter, sorry, Newton per mm square or 5.5 mega Pascal also we call it. Okay, this is the bare minimum crushing strength which a brick, brick should have. Below this, definitely not acceptable. Okay, uh, above this, definitely it's a good thing. If your crushing strength is more than this, then that is a good thing, right? So they are asking you, no brick should have. Brick should have this. Equal to 5.5, I mean that is minimum, so fine, even if it is equal, it's fine. 5 to 10, even better, right? It is going up till 10, so it's obviously better. Below 5.5, yes. No brick should have crushing strength below 5.5 Newton per mm square or mega pascals. okay? So, the answer will be number 4. Okay, question number 29. Any any doubts, any questions you have? Okay, I, I use you, no. Fine. Question number 29. The bending stress in a ball or column subjected to effective vertical load need not be considered if eccentricity ratio is less than or equal to 1 by 12, more than 1 by 4, less than or equal to 1 by 6, less than or equal to 1 by 24. It's less than or equal to 1 by 24. Basically, this is a standard. See, again, calculation is not possible. This is a standard. This is given by IS1905. In this particular standard, IS in its standards 1905, you can uh, look into page number, it was something 1617 page mein, there is a table about eccentricity and below that table there is a note which is given. In that note, it is written, this particular thing is written. You can keep these things in mind. See, these are standard related questions. You have to keep these things in mind, okay. Then question 30. To which age does Indus Valley Civilization belong to? So, Indus Valley Civilization belongs to your Neolithic age. This doesn't belong to Chalcolithic, Mesolithic or Paleolithic. It belongs to the Neolithic age. Okay. Uh, fine. So, we have done 30 questions. Let's keep it here only. It's already uh, 4.30. Rest we can uh, carry on later on also. We'll carry on in the next class. That is tomorrow's class. We'll again solve next 30 questions. And on Sunday, we'll be left with 20 questions. So, we can solve that. Okay. So, uh, let's keep it in here. If you have any doubt, you can ask me. Anyway, you didn't understand anything or uh, you have any specific, uh, you know, query related DDA or anything else. Whatever we have uh, done, I hope that is clear to you. And whenever we are solving PYQ, make sure you keep on noting what other uh, your... Uh, options are about okay now here if you see if you don't know what is neolithic paleolithic chocolatic mesolithic age just go and look a little bit about this and write down okay similarly here you don't need to study about the other options just like in this question you can look into what is the uh, you know use of alumina in your brick what is the use of silica in the brick these two are very important constituents of brick and very major constituents of brick so why do we add these does this impart something definitely it does impart what does it impart you already have i already told you what iron oxide does and then magnesia already knows so write those things down okay just don't stick to one thing 
Like you know what is tropopause, so you got to know. But what is stratopause, mesopause, thermopause? So make sure you draw this entire thing. Right? So I hope the uh, whatever we have done is uh, clear. No doubts, anybody? Okay, I assume there are no doubts. Fine, so if you don't have any doubts, even if you have later on, you can probably put them down in the comment section. But if you don't have any doubts, uh, we can just stop the session here only. And we'll meet in tomorrow's class, same time, 3.30 to 4.30. Thank you everyone for joining. And if you want any other information about the classes which are running, you can definitely call or contact our counsellors. The numbers will be given in the description. Thank you everyone.